This is the 9680 podcast, episode 21, The Rex of the Interregnum, the start of Vespasian's reign. I know it's been six episodes, but we're back into the main narrative. Let's start with a recap. As you might recall, Vespasian revolted against the random, gluttonous emperor Vitellius from his position in Judea. He managed his half-empire and directed his rebellion from Alexandria in Egypt, and sent the governor of Syria, Musianus, to take Italy. Musianus acted as a colleague in imperial dignity, in essence, a co-emperor. Before Musianus could get there, though, Antonius Primus, a Danubian legate, convinced the legions of the Balkans to take Italy. And the invasion went swiftly enough until his brass tacks encountered the delicate situation in the capital. Vitellius attempted to abdicate, mediated by the new emperor's brother, Sabinus. Eventually, the cornered Vitellians violently responded, pinning the capital's Flavians onto the Palatine Hill. Sabinus held the hill, protecting his nephew, the 18-year-old son of Vespasian, Domitian, and on the 19th of December, the Vitellians stormed the hill. It's said that Sabinus's unwillingness to spill Roman blood led to him losing the initiative and his own death. Domitian fled the hill and hid, perhaps in a nearby temple and stayed the night. The next day, the 20th of December, Primus ordered his troops into the city. Primus and his army felt some sort of resentment after the tough campaign they ran and the rough defense of the emperor and the death of Sabinus. So the city was violently ransacked. Blood and corpses filled the streets. Any and all important men of the city, especially those identifying with Vitellius, hid in their homes or fled entirely. Vitellius was tracked down and killed. Conversely, the young Domitian emerged after the fighting subsided and was hoisted on the shields of the Danube legionnaires and proclaimed as their Caesar. To quote Tacitus's thoughts on the war, the civil war, which, beginning in Gaul and Spain and afterwards drawing into the struggle first Germany and then Illyricum, had traversed Egypt, Judea, Syria, and every province and every army, this war, now that the whole earth was, as it were, purged from guilt, seemed to have reached its close. I'd like to quickly mention that that quote was 51 words, a single sentence, and had 13 commas. This particular translation of Tacitus is really starting to get on my nerves. Now, most times when you hear about this transition of power or those like it, you'll hear a simple version. Vitellius died, and the next day Vespasian was hailed as emperor by the Senate. And then, nine months later, he strolled into Rome. But I urge you to think for a second what it really would have felt like on the eve of the 20th. We might think of it as very simple and obvious that the next day the Senate would officially elevate Vespasian and all would be well with the world, but everyone had to go to sleep on the 20th without knowing what is going to happen next. Was Vespasian's first act as emperor to launch a purge? Probably, but to what extent will that purge go? Most senators would have tried to be amical with Vitellius. They had to. Are they all in danger then? What if Musianus tried to make himself emperor? What if Primus, crazy as he is, does the same? And finally, it might be inconceivable to consider, but the ancient sources definitely thought it a possibility, what if Domitian tried to take his father's job? What if another conspiracy comes to light and the leading Flavians got killed in the city? What would happen then? The situation is extremely delicate, and anything could go wrong. What about all the men on the inside of Italian administration? Most of them weren't active in the feasting and debauchery of that emperor, and now are risking losing their position in control of the state. What about all the governors, all the praetors, and the consuls? Imagine the fear and the concern that these people all felt. Imagine all the negotiations, from the essential to the needless and desperate, that took place on the night that aren't known to us. Every time there is a change in power that isn't a perfect fait accompli, there will be uncertainty. The replacement of Claudius, for example, is a fait accompli, if you subscribe to the theory that he was killed by Nero's mother. He was killed, and Nero was immediately ready to take the emperorship. This, in effect, caused no uncertainty within the empire. Fear was created, for sure, there was a 16-year-old emperor, but everyone knew who was in charge, and there was no opportunity for anyone to take power, so there was a seamless transition of power. But now, the new emperor was over half a year away. In fact, the only imperial presence was the teenager. When everyone woke up on the winter solstice of the year 69, there was a lot that was undecided. The emperor was dead, and the eternal city was in ruin. Furthermore, the revolt in Judea was still in action, and the shuffling of governors on the Rhine resulted in inadequate defense, and a revolt was underway there as well. Everything was so uncertain that after Vitellius' murder, a contingent of Flavian cavalry was dispatched to ensure stability in the Italian countryside, 
even the backyard of the capital was in a precarious position and had to be militarily balanced. The Senate was in shambles, and a couple unsavory individuals dominated the political conversation of the ancient and respected body. Primus was the man who led the troops into the city, and therefore held a certain primacy for this reason. He was the leading military figure within arm's length. Domitian was the son of the new emperor, and newly elevated by the troops as junior emperor, and was more than willing to exercise whatever power he could get his hands on. Mucianus, unfortunately, was still a week away. So on the Senate's first meeting after the death of Vitellius, they had nobody but Domitian to oversee them. This first day was crucial for maintaining the peace and for each powerful man to grab as much power as they could, so it was definitely going to be a dicey meeting of the Senate. Now, with Primus and Domitian as temporary leaders of Rome, the Senate felt emboldened. See, ever since Augustus did a number on the Senate's power, the Senate had little direct influence in politics. They were still an important body, of course, but it seems to me that their importance was only in being the club that the top hundred or so Romans were all in. The sway of the empire was down to the individual relationships and the emperor. The senate could voice approval or disapproval, but otherwise had no real influence. Individual senators, however, may assert more influence than the entire rest of the body as a result of their personal interactions with the emperor. The senate was something of a bellwether. The senate would appoint emperors and would put people in their place. Recall that Nero was only truly done when the Senate met, proclaimed Galba emperor, and Nero an enemy of the state. The real power was held by Galba, but it was the Senate's decision that set everyone in motion. This is not the same Senate that we met in the Republic. That institution is entirely gone. And the modern Senate held a very different kind of power, diminished by the day-to-day -day oversight of the emperor. Today, however, there was no actual emperor to exert daily influence over the Senate. The last time this happened was when Nero was in Greece, and he returned to revolts. This unique opportunity empowered the Senate to do things. This was a rare opportunity. As a matter of fact, the next and nearly last time the Senate would have this kind of authority will be the day of Domitian's assassination, when they will appoint his successor. Off the top of my head, that appears to be the last significant exertion of senatorial authority. I am lessening the importance of the elevation of Tacitus in the 270s. Obviously, the senators in Rome on the 21st of December in 69 didn't know their future, but they appreciated their opportunity as something like once in a generation. The Senate felt particularly pretty on this day because letters from both Vespasian and Misianus were presented, written for this occasion speaking very highly of the Senate and painting Vespasian as humble and silently giving the Senate permission to act while Vespasian was in the East. The first thing for the Senate to consider was the ratification of Vespasian's rule. The regular imperial titles and dignity were bestowed upon Vespasian, and it was determined that Vespasian and Titus would hold the consulships for the year 70. Of course, Domitian exerted his own influence, and so it was essential that he be appointed to an extraordinary praetorship. His praetorship, which appointed him to the maintenance of the city of Rome itself, would typically place that magistrate as one of the highest ranking people in the city. For Domitian, however, additional consular authority was bestowed upon his praetorship. He had been hailed as Caesar by the troops, but this title would be officially granted to him and Titus, securing the succession. Mucianus was granted a triumph for when he arrived in the city, and Primus was granted consular rank. That is, he never served the consulship, but he would be treated as if he had for the rest of his life, technically furthering his career with the possibility of a governorship in the future. But he would never be able to wield this power. We'll dig into that later. Next was something so mundane that you probably wouldn't even consider it to be a big part of the Senate's agenda, and all things considered, it probably shouldn't have been. This is the need to send a delegation to the Emperor. As it turns out, the Senate becomes torn on the issue of either electing or appointing the delegates. The consul-elect suggested that the delegates be appointed, and a certain Marcellus disagreed, expecting himself to be chosen as one of the delegates, if by vote, but probably wouldn't get appointed, so he wanted a vote to be done. A certain Helvidius disagreed, suggesting that the delegates should be appointed. Tacitus goes into full detail about the drama between these two, but it should suffice to say for now that they just hated each other. Helvidius attacked the character and the motives of Marcellus, and Marcellus refuted with an appeal to precedent and to the slander against Vespasian for Helvidius to argue in favor of something that grants some amount of power to someone other than the emperor. The speeches were both well received, and a grueling debate eventually resulted in the decision to elect the delegates. But I couldn't find if Marcellus did actually get elected or not. Anyways, the next issue on the agenda was the economic crisis. The capital has been destroyed, and the coffers were empty. The Senate was again divided on the solution for this issue. 
The consul elect proposed that due to the extreme nature of the issue, the emperor's judgment should be awaited. Helvidius, the same man as in the previous debate, instead proposed that this matter should be at the discretion of the senate. There was considerable debate, and a tribune's veto was even enacted. Eventually, the senate more or less acquiesced to Helvidius, choosing that the capital should be restored at the public's expense, and that Vespasian would also contribute monetarily to this. This is relatively extraordinary, that the senate decided what the emperor had to contribute money to. Tacitus does add that the decision was mostly forgotten, but we do know with certainty that Vespasian put considerable effort into rebuilding the city. So whether or not he knew or cared about the obligation to the Senate, it was in Vespasian's character to spend on the maintenance of the capital, and maybe he was doing his due diligence to the Senate. A final thing discussed by the Senate was a feud between several senators, a trial settling which was supposed to take place on the 22nd of December, the next day. However, without the emperor and with the uncertainty that hung in the air, it was postponed, and we'll talk about it soon. The situation in the capital after this day in the Senate that left almost nobody happy is best summed up by Tacitus. There was division in the Senate, resentment among the conquered, and no real authority in the conquerors, and in the country at large, no laws and no emperor. Things were so uncertain that the seat of power was unclear, and for an uneasy week, Domitian and Primus, young and rash, were dominant in the city and therefore over the empire. It is into this mess that Mucianus arrives. Mucianus celebrates his triumph as voted by the Senate a week earlier. The astute among you may have pointed out something. Why is Mucianus celebrating a triumph if he fought only a civil war? Weren't triumphs only awarded for foreign victories and the inclusion of new territory into the empire? After all, even Julius Caesar himself had to celebrate only foreign victories in his triumphs, and when he departed from the norm, there was massive clapback. Mucianus' triumph was awarded in Vale. See, on his way to Rome, Mucianus had to subdue some barbarians on the Danube. Primus' invasion of Italy left the region open, and Mucianus had to clean up the mess. So, Mucianus marched triumphantly into the city, ostensibly celebrating the subjugation of barbarians, but everyone knew it was a show of force to scare the Vitalians. In fact, this was a perfect entrance for the policies enacted by Mucianus to secure the empire. Mucianus would set the empire straight, and from here until Vespasian's arrival in the fall, he will dominate the political scene in Rome. Mucianus is, in Vespasian's stead, effectively the emperor and he fits the role well, finally putting some imperial dignity and authority back into the capital. The most crucial thing Mucianus did was take control for himself, and therefore protect Vespasian's interest and keep the power away from Primus, Domitian, and the Senate. Upon his arrival, the political influence of Primus instantly plummeted, but his military influence remained, and this made him dangerous. Tacitus insinuates that Primus was recruiting for a revolt against Mucianus, and it took clever maneuvering from Mucianus to get around this. The problem was that the Flavian troops approved of their commander who marched into the city with them, so Mucianus was militarily at a disadvantage in Rome, and a violent rebellion led by Primus could be catastrophic and successful. So, Mucianus first heaps praises, honors, and titles upon Primus to satiate his ambition. Then, Primus was silently promised a governorship in Spain, so that he would act like a good boy. Then, while Primus was rejoicing in the advancement of his career, Mucianus slowly and deliberately moved all the legions loyal to him to various provinces far from the capital, not only getting them out of Primus' direct control, but splitting them up so they couldn't join up against Mucianus, thus rendering moot this dangerous force. From here, Primus never shows up again in the narrative, only being briefly mentioned in passing over the next few decades. He lived in something like self-exile, peacefully into old age. There were multiple rebellions underway in Germany and North Africa, and the dispersion of the Danubian armies helped in quelling these insurgencies, so not only did this to secure the capital, it secured the frontiers as well. When Primus was out of the picture, Mucianus became the only military force in the capital. The rest of Mucianus' jockeying pushed power out of the hands of the remaining Vitellians and the Senate, and into the hands of him and other Flavians. A small purge of the Vitellians was ordered to scare the Senate straight, and honestly, he went a bit too far. The final piece of power for Mucianus to subjugate on Vespasian's behalf was Domitian himself. Recall that Domitian had been given that exceptional praetorship, praetor of the city with Imperium. Mucianus kept Domitian under his wings by, similarly to Primus, indulging him in some respects while absolutely suffocating him in others. Domitian was still given the extraordinary praetorship, and his name would be placed on the edicts and letters sent by the imperial administration in Rome. From this, it seemed almost as though Domitian was the emperor, exactly kind of what he wanted. 
However, the overwhelming position of Mucianus meant that he held the real control. He had all the relevant friends and all the relevant soldiers under his own name. Domitian was no longer the primary political force in the city, as he was when only Primus held power alongside him, so his power was extraordinarily limited. Domitian would exert limited power, but bowing to Mucianus. It is with these moves, smart and politically minded, that Mucianus secures the city, and kept it under his firm control for nearly a year, ready for Vespasian and Titus to enter in the fall. This brings me to a question I discussed in my episode about Primus's invasion of Italy. Should Primus have invaded Italy before Mucianus' arrival? I think the obvious answer, now that we've approached the fallout in Rome, is no. Primus did win the war, I should get kudos for that, he unseated Vitellius and flipped most armies in the region to Vespasian's banner. But what could have been different if he waited a month for Mucianus? And yes, not even a month's difference. Mucianus arrived in Rome a week after Primus, and Primus effectively had to rush into the city to beat him there. Primus's victory over the Vitellian troops at Cremona was close, all things considered. The two armies were similar in size, in ability, and in authority. The addition of Mucianus's imperial army from the east would have completely flipped the scales towards the Flavians. The victory becomes trivial. In fact, consider how many people switched sides to Vespasian upon Primus's invasion. Now consider that Primus's army had no imperial backing or presence on site, but still managed to exert more influence than the Vitellians. Now imagine how much influence would then be exerted by an even larger army that had the de facto emperor Mucianus on site. Honestly, the victory over Vitellius probably could have occurred without a fight. Primus had to win multiple battles against the Vitellians, ransack the home province, and destroy the capital. Mucianus' ability and influence could have allowed a more seamless takeover, more similar to Galba's ascension. In fact, if it weren't for the brash and rapid invasion of Primus, we might have seen the successful abdication of Vitellius. Mucianus was a more equipped leader, and was more in tune with the imperial policies of Vespasian. He, and not Primus, had the skills to maneuver the abdication of Vitellius, because really, Primus blew it. Recall why the abdication, as organized by Sabinus in Rome, failed. The Vitellians got scared, and they wanted to remain in control. They didn't want to lose their position, they didn't want to lose their ability to lounge around and do whatever they wanted. To me though, it mostly seems like it was out of fear. Those aligned with Vitellius, seeing a Flavian army outside the city, didn't know how the new emperor would receive them. They may have expected to all be murdered, and the soldiers expected to be discharged without good pay. So, their only move was to stop the abdication out of fear. However, the presence of Mucianus, and maybe his personal input and assurance of security and imperial seal, could have allowed the successful abdication. Upon entering the city, peacefully then, Mucianus would honorably discharge the Vitellians with generous retirements and place the senior members of the administration into a cushy pseudo-exile to retire and live out their days in peace with a stipend from Rome, and the administration of the empire would be seamlessly carried over as a Vitellian administration would largely remain the same. This would appease everyone and place so much love in the new regime, and add a lot of stability to the empire while there are three simultaneous revolts. On top of the increasing Flavian position overall, here are the following things that could have been accomplished by the successful abdication of Italius and the peaceful entrance of Mucianus into the city. This could have prevented the destruction of the Italian peninsula, the destruction of the city itself, the mass slaughter that occurred at Primus' command, the coming purge of the Vitellians, the death of the Flavians within the city on the Palatine, the death of Sabinus himself, and finally, it could have contributed to preventing the tyrannical reign of Domitian. Some attribute the trauma caused by the murder of Sabinus and his near-death experience to Domitian's cruelty later in his life and in his reign. So perhaps the abdication of Vitellius could have led into a 40-year reign under a conscientious Domitian, and he would have been remembered as the best emperor since Augustus. This is of course uh, super wishful and speculative, but the simple action of Primus not invading Italy before Mucianus arrives could have ramifications that are mostly good for the Roman Empire. That even if I've reached a bit too far and calling Domitian the next Augustus because of this is maybe a bit silly, I've shown what a missed opportunity this was and how much better it could have been. Anyways, back to the narrative. The Senate met on the 1st of January after swearing Vespasian and Titus into their consulships, while they were still in the east. Domitian, praetor of the city and du jour emperor, made a well-received and measured speech to the Senate. He is praised for modesty, which Tacitus thinks is feigned. I, however, believe the 18-year-old was being genuine. He proposed that honors be returned to Galba, an interesting but well-calculated move for the new dynasty to connect themselves to previous emperors. 
Since Vitellius' reign of over half a year, most people have forgotten that Galba sucked quite a bit, so it was good to associate with him. And since they wanted to distance themselves from Vitellius, might as well associate themselves with the emperor who Vitellius revolted against. On the same day, commissioners were appointed to reimburse those affected by the war and to clean up the calendar from all the nonsense added by the various random emperors. This tightened the expenditure on needless festivals and would therefore help with the money problem in the city. Some senators were restored to their position as they returned to Rome after the violence had stopped. That dispute that was supposed to be settled on the 22nd was to be settled now. This was a particularly sensitive matter, which is why it had to remain unresolved until order was created in the city by Mucianus, as this matter had to do with informers. What some senators wanted was access to records of who snitched during the reign of Nero, which resulted in senatorial executions. They asked Domitian, the Caesar, to give this information. Domitian, who isn't given any credit for this by Tacitus, by the way, declines and says that the emperor himself needs to approve that. There was violent arguing in the Senate, as debates became personal attacks against people that were suspected to be informers, such as our old friend Helvidius, who attacked Marcellus, who you should recall from the earlier debate on the 21st. The next time the Senate met, Domitian spoke at length about how they shouldn't dig up the informers of the past right now. Mucianus spoke in agreement, and again, Tacitus gives Domitian no credit for this. The Senate, which was emboldened in late December, now felt subservient to Domitian and Mucianus. As a gesture to the Senate, though, they sent two unliked senators into exile. We now enter 70 AD in our narrative, going deep into January at the second meeting of the Senate. This is our seventh episode in the narrative, and we've only covered a two-year-long period. Don't worry, the pace will pick up really quickly. This is a very action-packed couple years. Recall that it was back in February of 68 AD, like less than two years ago, that Vindex first revolted against Nero. From that moment until Mucianus secured the city and Vespasian and Titus were sworn into their consulships on the 1st of January 70, the empire was in a state of flux. Not only this, it is exactly a year ago, the 1st of January in 69 AD, that the troops under Vitellius in Germania didn't take up their oaths for Galba, setting his murder in motion and the rebellions of both Vitellius and Otho. So much has happened in a, such a short time. In fact, most of this episode has been devoted to a period of less than two weeks, from the death of Vitellius on the 20th of December to the 1st of January. In this episode, we went from the turbulent entry of the troops of Antonius Primus in Rome to the securing hand of Mucianus in early January. Now, Rome settles into place. For the narrative, I'll leave it there. For now, though, if you want to ask me questions or leave suggestions for the podcast, head on over to my de facto website, the 96AD subreddit. Just head on over to reddit.com slash r slash 96AD. You can find the link in the podcast description. I'll be posting updates about the podcast there, and I'll respond to anybody who posts there or messages me. Another thing you'll find on the subreddit is the PayPal donate button. This is not required or expected. This podcast will remain free, and I don't aim to profit. However, donations will cover the cost of production and will support me, a student, who is attempting to study, work, and produce this podcast all at once. I know it may seem like kind of a tease to talk about the early reign of Vespasian, but talk nothing of the man himself. Don't worry, his time will come. This is my tentative plan for the next couple episodes. Next time, I will talk about the Jewish revolt that Vespasian is handling to explain his initial position there. The episode after that, I'll talk about what happened under Vespasian. Finally, I will complete Vespasian's trilogy by talking about him as a person and as an emperor. So, if you've been patiently waiting for the tales of the affable and joking emperor, they are coming soon. Mm -hmm.